Madam Mayor, uh, Ms. Henrik and Barane and all of you, uh, great to be with you. Uh, I feel very much at home. This is my hometown. Grew up here. And uh, water, as Anne-Sophie said, the mayor, is really a, an integral part of the Gothenburg life. Uh, it's a city at the sea. It's a city at a river, historic river. Uh, it's a city of a uh, port, a great port, hopefully growing port. <laughs> And it's a city of a Navy base, as it used to be. I was a Navy officer also before I went off to uh, the School of Economics here in Gothenburg and then off to the Foreign Ministry and out to the world and the serving the Swedish government and also serving the United Nations in different capacities. And I think it's great that you meet here uh, in the city to discuss one of the crucial issues, I think, of the, these times, namely water. And I will, uh, I will look at this subject from a global perspective but also give you a little bit of flavor since I have worked with the water issues uh, for many, many years. I was um, Under Secretary for Humanitarian Affairs, I was responsible for the emergency relief in the uh, early 90s and um, I then had uh, a life-deciding uh, experience in Somalia in 1992 I won't describe the horrors that I saw, but I, I saw children die in front of me out of uh, diarrhea, dysentery, dehydration, <coughs> and starvation also. But the water, the lack of water, uh, or the, the uh, existence of bad water <laughs> was the reason they died in front of me. And I, dis I said then at that time, 28 years, 25 years ago, that I will continue to work with this. So I, I took it on in the UN, and I took it on uh, in Sweden, and I created, started uh, Water Aid Sweden. And we have the new uh, president of Water Aid International here, uh, Rob Skinner. Could you stand up? Because I, I think we should give him applause. That's a great organization. <coughs> and uh, give him all support. I am honorary ambassador still for that organization. <laughs> I did one thing that I, I think I will do to you also. When I was president of the General Assembly, I uh, saw the audience, I was then sitting in front of 193 nations and I wanted really to make an appeal on water. So I started to speak about the importance of water, but they were still talking among themselves. So I thought I had to get their attention. So what I did was I took up a glass of water, uh, which was tap water, and I did exactly this. And I said, do you know? And then suddenly everybody got quiet. Do you know? that what I just did here, pull a glass of tap water, drink it like this, is a dream, a luxury, for at that time, this was 2005, six, about 950 million people. And this is the reason for 2,000 children dying every day, whatever the figure was at the time. And that is what people remember. I still meet people at that meeting who say, I remember when you raised the glass and reminded us of what this is, this luxury of clean and fresh water. So this has been very much a theme in my professional life, and I was very glad then to accept this invitation. And I thought I would uh, give you a couple of s snapshots from my experience first and then come to some more conceptual issues uh, <coughs> in the next 10, 15 minutes. I just uh, got a report from New York. They still keep me posted. I left the UN at the end of last year. But I got a report last night from uh, the Secretary General's office, Antonio Guterres. And he had flown by helicopter over what was once upon a time the Aral Sea in Russia. And he said, I've never experienced any time in my life a more dramatic illustration of an ecological disaster. With mismanagement of the, that resource, uh, the, the water disappearing, ships lying around the coastlines as, as uh, corpses of fishing life, was to him a shock. And suddenly I had a flashback 
when I saw that report last night from Antonio Guterres, from the RLC, where he was two days ago, I had a flashback to when I was mediating in the war on Darfur. Uh, for some reason, I went across in the region, and I also flew a helicopter in that area. And it was over Lake Chad. Or I would rather describe it as what, what, what was remaining of Lake Chad. It, turns, it turned out, and it was a complete shock to me 11 years ago, that 80% of the lake had disappeared. And it was just a horror sight. You saw the green moving in there and a brown area in the middle. And flying over that area was, to me, the shock. And was a d description of that we, in humanity, still haven't come to the conclusion that we have to live in harmony with nature. Uh, that we have to accept that everything living is part of us, whether it is animals or plants. The indigenous populations in Latin America, Canada, Sweden, Nordic countries know very much more the need to be in harmony with nature. My daughter, Emily, who is with me here, this not here, but in, here now in Gothenburg, asked me once when I came back from a, a negotiation uh, in a conflict, why don't you stop working with these stupid conflicts between people instead of starting a negotiation with nature? We need to have peace with nature. <laughs> I, I still haven't been able to do that. Hard to see the other one on the other side, isn't it? Unless you stand up for this more wise approach that I think Gothenburg and perhaps Copenhagen today will symbolize by showing that you are truly wise cities and are aware of this need for, I would say, accepting responsibility. Maybe the most important word today in the world. Except another word that is equally important, and that is the word together. I don't think we will be able to do anything unless we realize that we have to work together. So those were the two snapshots from shrinking lakes, huge lakes. Another, another snapshot that I have only from two years ago was going to Vietnam. I was in Vietnam almost two years ago. And uh, would you need a glass of water over there? Hey, y you need a glass of water? I have one. <laughs> um, I went to Mekong, the Mekong Delta of Vietnam. I had thought this would be a green area where lots of fisheries were going on and agriculture. Did I ever make a mistake? What has happened is that the dams that are being built around Mekong have lowered the level of the Mekong River. But the serious effect is a dual one, namely the water from the sea, from the ocean, comes into the fresh water. And by that stops the fisheries, which is based on freshwater fishing. And the ground, the, 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 the earth there is very porous, so that the salt water enters the ground, and I saw many, many huge areas of brown rice fields because the salt water had contaminated the grass. And the farmers that I interviewed going around there in that area said that their cattle was getting sick because they were eating the grass that was salty. So the cattle were sick and feeling very bad. And the sons of that family that I visited said, we can't live here anymore we will move to the cities further in. <laughs> so sea level rise is here and now. It's not in 30, 40 years' time. It's happening now. And you can imagine this area around Mekong Delta is an area of 18 million people. And when they start moving, if th that's the serious, then you can imagine the social, economic, political consequences. And look at Bangladesh and India and Myanmar or Burma, you will see the same. So I saw that with my own eyes. I saw, I saw sea level rise uh, at, and the problems of the, the water resources at, with my own eyes. 
One thing that I think we need to be aware of also when it comes to water, if I now want to, to give this, get this global perspective, is that water in so many cases is a scarce resource. And when there are scarce resources, historically, there are two ways of reacting for those who want those resources. One is to compete, even fight about it. And the other one is to cooperate around the scarce resource. And unfortunately, I've seen far too many examples of um, fighting about it. I was mediating in the Darfur conflict, as I said, and uh, the most horrible thing that I remember was that a way for the militia to, th to chase away the population from a particular area was to throw a dead dog or dead goat in the well of a village. And then, of course, within days, people had to flee. And they moved into the huge uh, camps for internally di displaced people. I asked myself, how much of a use and joy did those people have of having a village without water? They couldn't move in there anyway. So it was a lose-lose proposition. People had to leave and nobody could take it over. I've also seen growingly how border conflicts can become very serious due to different interests of boundaries, river bo with crossing borders. You have, on the one hand, one country that needs to develop energy, Tajikistan, Ethiopia, and then you have another country which has very great interest in maintaining agriculture as they traditionally have, Egypt and Uzbekistan. And the tensions around these areas is extremely difficult. So I have personally think coined an expression that I think will unfortunately be relevant for the future, and that is what I call hydro diplomacy, water diplomacy. And my vision um, is that we will be innovative and make sure that we use water as a reason for cooperation rather than conflict. The young people here, uh, I just talked a while for to one. Julia, where are you? Julia from Gothenburg. There you are. I gave you a task at Chalmers. And one of the things you should think about is how to develop projects that are mutually rewarding and making sure that you share resources. I have worked so much with the conflicts in the Middle East, from uh, the classic Israel-Palestine conflict to, to uh, uh, Iran-Iraq war. Unfortunately, we failed on Syria. I would say due to the Security Council not being able to agree. But I think the, the, um, the need for us to do confidence building in that part of the world is important. And can you imagine, for instance, just an example of how water can be a positive factor if the water resources on the West Bank, occupied by Israel, if the water resources on that West Bank were fairly divided and shared. Now, the Israeli settlers use four times more fresh water than the Palestinians. So they have their swimming pools and grass, fine green, green grass, while the olive trees are dying in the Palestinian territory. I, I perhaps caricature it somewhat, but I'm telling my Israeli friends, why don't you share that more fairly? Can you imagine a better confidence building measure and people as showing that you accept the equal value of everybody? I make this point that a great challenge is to make sure that water becomes a positive force. Now, I have now talked about the, the uh, larger political, economic, social perspectives of water and hopefully also given you a sense of urgency. But I think I want to translate this as much as I can to something that you will be able to do. And that is to make sure that you, as much as possible now, in this situation of scarcity, go deeper into the issues of saving water or making sure that you have circular patterns, there is so much waste, and that you also identify the horrible effects of bad waste management. 
I've seen so many horrible rivers in the, country, in the world. I've seen so many lakes destroyed, so many coastal areas destroyed. I've seen so much, not seen it personally, but the plastic in the sea, which is horrible danger to, to the, the oceans. And the, there was a great oceans conference uh, last week at the initiative of Fiji and Sweden. I'm proud of that. And um, we need definitely to, to look at how we manage, how we, how we steward, ex exercise serious and responsible stewardship for water. And here you have a very special responsibility because there is another global trend apart from the scarcity of water and I would say also climate change as an unfortunate structural <sighs> problematic area to say the least. But it is, it is very important that we also see another trend now of which you are part, many of you, I think most of you, namely the importance and the growing role of cities, urban areas. Like Sweden, the world is now, Sweden was once in the 30s, I think we had 75% of the population living in rural areas and 2025 in the cities. Now it's, uh, I can't, I don't know the percentage in Sweden, but I know in the world, more than half of the world population live in urban areas and cities. And the forecast for 2030 is up to 60, 65, 2050, probably 70%. Uh, it's a bit difficult to, to exact prognostication, but anyway, the trend is there. So we will see more and more of urban areas. And unfortunately, the movement is mainly people moving, people moving in poor countries into um, suburbs, I would say slums of urban uh, concentration areas. And I have seen horrible things with enormously damaging effect on sanitation, an issue for water aid, um, with no toilets and uh, very much open defecation. Uh, which is a euphemism for what you all know, people doing it outside. And this is a huge danger from the point of view of health, but also a challenge for you as city planners and water experts to find methods that work in those environments where you have no municipality tax to speak about and where you don't, in some cases, even know who owns the land where the problems are. So here is a problem of both finding ways that can be easily adapted to the, that situation, but also can, can be collective solutions and, of course, less dependent on water. Because in Sweden, I remember when I was a child, you flushed the toilet and it was eight to ten liters of fresh water, drinking water, that every time you flushed. Today it's being brought down to, what is it, four liters or something? But still, it's a, it's a waste. And you can't imagine this in Africa, in the drought areas, or in India or China, uh, when you are supposed to set up a system for these huge urban areas. So here, of course, we are fortunate in the two cities that will soon come on this stage, Gothenburg and Copenhagen. And we have uh, good, well-functioning institutions, and we have a pretty good resource base. And we have a pretty good awareness of, of accepting this responsibility, but in so many other places in the world, there is no such infrastructure, there is no such knowledge. And we have to understand in today's world that the problems of the rest of the world is indeed the problems for all of us. So even if you now deal with the issues of planning of this wonderful city and the cities that you represent, uh, still try to keep that international perspective. Because I, I believe in today's world that we must accept that there is very little difference between the global and the local, uh, the international and the national. When I work at the UN with climate change, with sustainable development, with the migration and refugee issues, which is a hot political issue for many countries, as we know, all around us. I feel that we 
really can't make a distinction between national and international. How can you make, how can you find a national solution to climate change or to <laughs> refugee flows? It's, it's logically impossible, isn't it? So my point is that a good international solution, like the Paris Agreement, which has to be implemented, whatever the President of the United States now says, the Paris Agreement is a good international formula, good international solution, which basically is in the national interest of member states. Can you imagine the day when we understand that the good international solution is a national interest? If this could be recognized in the parliaments, like the US Congress, <laughs> we are at home. We have reached what we really need to do, take away the sharp line between national and international. But I also claim, and this will conclude my remarks, I also claim that the way we, who have societies which are based on strong institutions, democracy, build our societies to be fair societies, without identifying groups as a problem, ethnically or religiously, if we can build up a, comp a society without corruption, with belief in justice, with belief in u basic human rights, what we then do, and this is my conclusion after many years in international service, building good societies at home is the best contribution you can make to international peace and security. Because if you have unstable societies, unfair societies, lack of respect of human rights, then you are conflict prone. It is in those countries where you see conflict. So international and national come together. And that's why I, having served 23 years abroad, five years now recently as Deputy Secretary General, even knowing that the United Nations is an organization which has weaknesses, that we have reasons to be very, very disappointed, I still believe that we need to really stand up for good international cooperation. We need to stand up for strong, good democratic institutions. We have to increase the trust in our societies. There is so much of a trust deficit in the world. And I, by doing that, by doing the work well as you do, with something which makes life better for your community, you in fact also do something which is better for your nation and for your region and for the world. So we are all in all this together, and I will end on that, the word together. Thank you very much. <clears throat>